are. And here we have Dr. Elizabeth Bolts, who is a brilliant um, consultant ophthalmic and oculoplastic surgeon, which means she is a specialist in all things eyes, eye health, as well as in um, doing eye lifts, um, nephroplasties. And um, can I ask you, Elizabeth, to start by saying a bit about why you were so... I, this, this way, I don't want it to sound rude saying you're obsessed with eyes, but you kind of have, have had an obsession with eyes from an early age, you said, and why you're so fascinated with eyes and how that led to you working in this area. Um, well, yeah, I suppose it is accurate to say I'm obsessed. Really close, yeah. uh, I am obsessed with eyes. Um, I've always wanted to be an eye surgeon. I'm actually from a family of ophthalmologists. My mum's an ophthalmologist, my husband's an ophthalmologist. So eyes have always been on the radar. Um, obviously, they are the most central aesthetic feature of the face, but I love the very delicate and precise nature of the surgery. And actually, even when I was a medical student, uh, from a cosmetic point of view, I used to uh, do all my friends' eye makeup for our bops um, at university. Oh, okay. They used to queue up and I do everyone's in, in the house that I lived in. Um, so I've always loved eyes. Yeah. Um, thank you. And you do a bit of non-surgical eye work as well, though blepharoplasty is your main thing, isn't it? Can you talk about what you can treat non-surgically and what needs to be treated surgically? So when people come to you for consultation, do you ever actually send them away or just give them a bit of toxin or eye revival and stuff, or do they usually benefit from surgery? Um, yeah, absolutely. That's how I got into um, non-surgical work, because not everyone has a surgical needs a surgical solution for eye rejuvenation. Some patients need a combination or some patients are, would actually do better with just non-surgical. Um, so I always offer a non-surgical option if there is one. Uh, particularly in younger patients as well, you may want to explore non-surgical options first. Sorry, I was seeing I've got more things about non-surgical than surgical. Would people mostly like me to talk about, get Elizabeth to talk about upper eyelid surgery and how straightforward it is? Yeah, okay. Because I think, um, I was saying to Mark, at Pacifico when he was he was here is that what brings most people in to see him because it seems to me that quite a lot of us now think an upper eye lift might almost be not quite a treatment but it's a step before you get on to other kinds of facial surgery yes definitely I think patients do find me for a surgical option but then if, if I don't feel that they're suitable for surgery I would offer non-surgical so yeah upper eyelid blepharoplasty is the gold standard treatment for excess folds of upper eyelid skin there's no best alternative non-surgical energy-based device out there at the moment. It is one of the most commonly performed procedures that I do. It's safe surgery with very high patient satisfaction. Essentially, it's just removing excess folds of upper eyelid skin, blepharon meaning eyelid, and plasty meaning to mold, so just moulding upper eyelid skin. Yeah. And it's a great operation and lasts about 10 years. Yes, it does, doesn't it? I've, I've had it done a couple of times myself, which people are often surprised by, but I've had very saggy eyelids from, a, from a, an early age. So, and yeah, it did last about 10 years, the first one. Um, and, and I think, could you also talk a bit about how, I'm always surprised by how quick and clean and easy an op it is. I'm, I'm not meant to be here selling eye lifts, but I just find in terms of, with non-surgical treatments, people often say, oh, there's this non-surgical option but you have to have four rounds of it and there's quite a lot of redness and peeling or burning or whatever and actually with surgery it's a big step there are scalpels there is sedation um, there is recovery but after two weeks it's kind of done and there's a bit more recovery after that but could you talk about what it involves in the recovery process yeah actually um, i think people are often quite surprised at the downtime from a surgical upper eyelid blepharoplasty compared to say some of the non-surgical energy-based devices and lasers. So it is a surgical procedure which is quite scary um, but it's all done safely and I always have an anaesthetist with me. You have the option of a general anaesthetic if you wish being fully asleep but most patients opt for just light sedation so they're nice and relaxed but it's always good practice to do the surgery with an anaesthetist around. Um, the operation itself takes around 60 minutes and downtime recovery wise you have small stitches in for seven days they come out. I like to take the stitches out myself. Um, and then around two weeks, you can start to wear makeup and contact lenses again. Yeah. So the recovery period isn't that bad. Exercise, as you say, three to four weeks. And that includes movements like yoga, downward dog. It's the bending forward and heavy, li heavy lifting that you need to avoid because that can cause a smooth bleed. Yes, because I remember, was it two, three, three years ago, I came to you for an eyelid ptosis correction and you did an upper bluff at the same time. 
um, and you really emphasizing how rest was a vital part of the recovery and I always like to think oh rest I could I could interpret that in my own way but you were quite fierce about it pointing out that the more I could rest in the first 10 days two weeks the quicker the rest of the recovery would be is, is that how it goes yeah. yes definitely and um, walking is encouraged okay. walking you know 10,000 steps a day that's fine but don't go crazy in the recovery period and do it. 20,000 but walking is always encouraged after an anaesthetic but it's really the movement of bending forward because that can cause a small bleed of very delicate blood vessels along the line. Yeah. But I did actually do a surgery on a spinning instructor who sort of agreed at three weeks she to do spinning class and that's what she Gosh. did and she was great she's okay. Okay because because that's going to be forcing the, the blood much faster through the, the whole Pumping area. It, yeah. Um, and, and also you can get um, very niche results that don't look as if you've been socked in the eyes with a couple of punches for, I don't know, I, I was very distressed because a friend had sent me pictures of his blepharoplasty a, a few months ago and I've been confidently saying to him from, from my own experience, oh it's fine, nobody would have known, you know, it was one tiny blood vessel that got, that got nicked by a uh, an, an, an anaesthetic bit you'd put in, but apart from that, but he sent his pictures and they were absolutely horrendous, but, but I felt it kind of shouldn't be like that, but I didn't want to say to him that it, it was too late by then, that you, you've had some awful, awful thing done, um, but it, it should be quite um, easy and straightforward. Now, what about lower blepharoplasty? Could you talk about how you do those, because you can do them inside the eyelid or not, and how you choose between those? Um, yes, yeah, so bruising from an upper bifo, as I can say, there's a lot that I put in the local anaesthetic and at the time of procedure to reduce the bruising and swelling. I put a lot of effort into that in a strict after call after protocol. Um, so hopefully you won't be too, won't look too bruised. But so lower, so the main reason for doing a lower eyelid blepharoplasty is to address lower eyelid puffiness. So the eyeballs in a bony socket called the orbit, which is cushioned in fat. And what happens over time is the fat starts to hold forward, the, and that's called eye bags, so it's a fat growing up. So blepharoplasty, to address that puffiness, you can either go internal, which is transconjunctival, or you can go external, which makes a cut underneath the eyelashes, it's called uh, subsidiary. Uh, the decision is made based on the examination findings. So lower lip blepharoplasty is different to uppers, so no operation is the same. There is no gold standard way of doing it. It depends on every patient's anatomy. So if you generally have a very loose eyelid so when you pull your eyelid down you can pull it far it would probably be more suitable for an external approach if you have if you're younger and you have tight eyelids the internal approach would work very well there is another technique as well where you can combine the two so either internal to reduce the fat and external to support the lid so it's a complex decision but it's usually made at the time of the consultation after a thorough examination okay. um Thank you. And do you also do sort of small cosmetic things like removing xanthelasmas, which are sort of build-ups of, what are they, cholesterol build-ups yeah. and other things like that on the eyelid? Yeah, definitely. So oculoplastic surgery is not just blepharoplasty. That is the bulk of it from the cosmetic point of view. Um, but xanthelasma, where you can get cholesterol deposits around there, that's a very common procedure that I perform. Uh, sty removal any lumps and bumps. It's common to get uh, skin tags around the eyelids and patients say it looks like sleep dust in the eye. But it's a really simple procedure that can be removed um, in, a, in a 25 minute appointment. Okay, yeah. Um, thank you. And I know the other thing that plagues me and I, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people listening is dry eye syndrome. It's when your eyes tend to water too much. You think it's, it's little wet eyes, but in fact it's because the eye is dry. Um, we've got about a minute, um, but could you say a few things that are helpful then? Maybe we should follow up with a live. We, we did once, years ago, do a brilliant live on dry eyes, which I completely failed to say, so that wasn't very helpful, but we can come back to that. But what are the key things that people suffering with dry eye should be thinking about? Um, so dry eye is really common, and the number one cause is blepharitis, uh, which is when the glands between your lashes are clogged up, and what they do is they secrete the oily layer of your tear film. So the best thing you can do is do lid hygiene at home, which is a specialist way to clean your eyelids. Essentially just using warm water to clean the upper lids and the lower lids just to keep the glands clean and um, expressing the oily contents well. Uh, use some lubricating eye drops if your eyes start to feel dry. Any sort of artificial tears that you can buy over the counter, preservative free containing hyaluronic acid are the best ones to use. It's a really important factor to consider for blepharoplasty surgery. And everyone I've seen tonight have asked specifically, do you have dry eye, do you do lubricating eye drops? Because it's a really important point and something that needs to be talked through in the positive. Yeah. 
paint you and thinking of the what makes my eyes dry i have i have habits that i know you don't approve of like using lash growth promoting serums could you just say a minute about why you are so not keen on lash growth promoting you also your eyelashes are just insane but that's without any lash promoting lash growth promoting these i i use the drug-based ones across the glandings and can you just say why do you think these are a bad idea i'm trying to wean myself off them but uh, mainly the side effects, they can cause orbital fat atrophy and make your eyelids look more sunken. They can cause dark circles and they can make blue eyes go brown. So that's all I can say in 10 seconds. There we go. <laughs> okay, I think we, we will stop there. We'll follow up with a live of Dr. Elizabeth Hawks. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much, Claire. Thanks for having me. Bye. Peace.